because it's just Braxton Hicks, yeah. like, you know, in terms of yeah. Braxton Pretty sure the water Hicks has or... broke at this point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what we're trying to clarify. So, yeah. Something's coming. <laughs> All right, guys, welcome back to episode nine of uh, the Pastor Eyes podcast. <laughs> guys, what are you seeing in um, chapter 13? I mean, so right off at me, I just, uh, it just seems odd. Verse one is like, hey, look at all these stones, how big they are. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> how old are the disciples? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, yeah, those are big rocks. I wonder, if, I wonder if they were like trying to uh, figure out how they got them up there. Like okay. the little kids, you know, okay. how, what? they didn't have bulldozers and stuff. You see these great buildings. It's like, yeah, I can see them. Yeah, I yeah. did know that. I, I did note that too. in in terms of the fact that it caught the disciples attention. Right. And my yeah. mind goes to, okay, well, which one was this again? Was this Peter? Was this Judas? Like is Judas seeing the marvelousness, the grandiose yeah. of the temple? And he's like, man, that's a lot of gold. I could probably <laughs> take some of that. <laughs> or if it was Peter is like, you know, Let's see if Jesus got something on the temple. Let's well, see. I, I Let's love Jesus' ability to always one up the shock value. I know. <laughs> like yeah. how wonderful this is. Yeah, well, this ain't gonna last. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Coming today where not a one of these stones is gonna be left on another one. Yeah, he refocused their attention sure. um, on what's gonna matter and, and the fact that, you know, in the same way that we say the same things, the four walls of the church don't you know, they don't matter in the big scheme of things. The church is the people and all the type of stuff. And Jesus is is bringing it back. Uh, one of the other things that I noticed, too, is, uh, you know, the temple, as we know later on, it's destroyed by fire. And uh, same thing with all the things of this earth. And so, you know, if we're trying to relate it to today, even my mind goes to, OK, well, we got to remind ourselves that everything in this world is going to pass away. And the way that it's going to go is that it's going to be fire. And so in that sense, no stone is left upon one another as far as where we're going. And uh, and perhaps that's because he's going into the end times. Like right after this, he's going into the end times and, right. you know, brings our mind to what's going to come of all of this, the things mm -hmm. that we're so used to and the things that we love so much. Um, and some are good and some will last, but but other things will not. So then he goes right into signs of the, the end times, but even says, hey, but you're going to see all this, but this ain't it yet. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you, you're going to see these things yeah. and you know, don't be alarmed because, you know, these things are going to happen. But that's not the end. Um, okay, so guys, I did a, a, a deep dive last night. I went down some rabbit holes mm. to to figure out, you know, what is all this? And I came across there's some writings that were done around 300 A.D. <clears throat> um, by a church father who wanted to write down church history. So he's using the works of Josephus. And he said some pretty interesting stuff. And I want I wrote it down and I want to read it to you because what happened in the siege of Jerusalem, Josephus is saying that was what Jesus was talking about or not. But all I want, the way, I want to read like all the abomination of desolation, like all of chapter 13. Yep. So I'll read what he what he wrote. But the number of calamities which everywhere fell upon the nation at that time, the extreme misfortunes to which the inhabitants of Judea were especially subjected. The thousands of men, as well as women and children that perished by the sword, by famine, and by other forms of death innumerable. All these things, as well as many, uh, as well as the many great sieges which were carried against the cities of Judea, and the excessive sufferings endured by those that fled to Jerusalem itself, as to a city of perfect safety, and finally the general course of the whole war, as well as its particular occurrences in detail, and how at last the abomination of desolation proclaimed by the prophets, Daniel 9.27, stood in the very temple of God, so celebrated of old, the temple which was now awaiting its total and final destruction by fire. All of these things, um, and this guy just says, are accurately described and written by Josephus. And then he goes on to say, this is later on in the, in the book, if anyone compares the words of our Savior with the other accounts of the historian, meaning Josephus, concerning the whole war, how can one fail to wonder and to admit that the foreknowledge and the prophecy of our Savior were truly divine and mar marvelously strange? Um, and then they actually quote this prophecy. Okay. Okay. So it's really interesting. It is. So did they speak to what they saw as the abomination of desolation at that point in time? They didn't. They just said that many abominations of desolations happened okay. in the temple. Okay, because we know there is one coming. I definitely read that particular. So from my perspective, it, it's talking about, you know, there's signs and then there's going to be persecutions and this is all kind of crescendoing, but that's not it yet. 
And so yeah. I, I would, you know, obviously the siege 8070 and all of that was part of beginning of birth pains. I which, think so. Which has yeah. been going on now for, you know, uh, basically 2,000 years. Well, that yeah. was my question, too. I wrote down, like, is this just Braxton Hicks? Pretty Braxton sure the water Hicks has and... broke at this point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what we're trying to clarify. So, yeah. Something's coming. I see verse 14 as, um, and, and not that it didn't happen, you know, with the, the raid of the, the temple, because there's been, yeah. uh, and there's been a lot of cases there have been multiple fulfillment of prophecies like that and where it happened and then it's going to happen again. But we know we definitely know it's going to happen again, according to Daniel. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's going to be a, a moment, um, a ruler is going to make a treaty with Israel, and and it's going to last for you know a week, a se- seven year period of time, and um, and midway through that, you know, he's going to bring his troops in and put an end to sacrifice and offerings, and and uh, and at that point in time, he's going to set up something, whether it's someone or something in the temple that is sacrilegious, some type of object that's going to be worshipped, that's going to be the abomination of desolation. Well, and that brings up the fact that the temple, they need a temple. Well, that's true. Right, yeah. So, you know, in terms of the timeline, if you're taking this in in the sense of, okay, well, there's got to be a temple that this is taking place in. Either you are interpreting something that has happened, like Josephus, and, of course, if he's, you know, what, second, third century, I think, when he was there, obviously they're they're thinking, this. well, this is the end of the world. Right, And yeah. just like we are. <laughs> that was my you point. Know? <laughs> yeah, like a thousand years from now, if we're still talking about this, like not us, but, you know. Right other people are talking about this, then at some point, you know, we're, we're looking at these wars and rumors of wars and various things, and we're going to see them as, as birth pains. And, and I think the way that it does put it, these are the beginnings, you know, we are seeing, mm-hmm. right. you know, it's either had, had been already fulfilled, and so we're not waiting for anything, or if we're taking it as, okay, well, this is yet to happen, then that means that there's got to be a temple. Yeah. Yeah, so I find it interesting that, you know, we can look throughout history and find basically evidence of all these things happening, and then... You know, Jesus in verse 24 says, but in those, day, in those days after the suffering, you know, basically the son of man is going to come. Right. And so like, you're like, oh man, it could be any minute. <laughs> and, you know, he kind of hints to that. Like you always have to be ready. You know, that's the, the charge, the end of um, chapter 13. I do want to go back to 13, mm-hmm. 13. And so it's when he's saying that there's a persecution. So the immediate context is the disciples. But he says, if you, um, you will be hated by everyone because of my name, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And so I guess the two-part question is, one, is there anything related within that to us today? And then the other aspect, or is it just for the disciples? And if it does relate to today, then what does that exactly mean? Because, you know, face value, at least we're seeing, well, the one who endures to the end will be saved. It feels like there's something that we've got to do, in a sense. There's something that we have to maintain or, you know, persist in, in order to be saved. Uh, it feels like a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like in the media it's context, tr- it's really <laughs> yeah. it's really for them. But I mean, we also know that there's going to be times in our lives where we, you know, face persecution. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Whether it's light or it's strong. like, yeah, it's definitely not to the extent that they faced it. I mean, they're beaten, beheaded, killed in any which way you can imagine. But we probably won't have to face that. And, and what, you know, if we want to r- run down the rabbit hole a little further, what has to endure? Mm. Yeah. It's not life because we know life doesn't right. endure. So it, uh, faith. That, it, that would be the assumption. Endurance of yeah. faith. Mm-hmm. And so is it the perseverance of the saints or is it the perseverance of the Savior? Yeah. It does where, you know, if you want to mix this thing up with it. <laughs> well, and <laughs> so who's doing the enduring? <laughs> yeah. And, and Jude versus 23 and 24. I'll just back up into 22. It says, And have mercy on those who, who waver. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. And have mercy on others coupled with a fear of God, hating even the clothes stained by the flesh. Now to the one who is able to keep you from falling and to cause you to stand, rejoicing without blemish before his glorious presence to the only God, our Savior, through the Lord Jesus Christ, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time and now and for all eternity. Amen. And so it's that idea of, yeah, the Savior, yes, of course, right. has the faithfulness. And that's what we rely on from the first place. Right. That's what we rely on for everything. Yeah. Right. But, and we're maybe pay, playing semantics here, <laughs> which <laughs> Pastor Randall's laughing because he knows this is what I like to do <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> um, but I, th- I do think words are important. And so in the sense of the meaning of the words and making sure that we get it right and understanding it right. 
that I think it's more a matter of which is the cause and which is the effect. I think that if, if the cause is that we have the faithfulness of God and we have responded to that in the sense of we are saved and we have a salvation, then, you know, and we're justified, so to speak, then the, the sanctification is worked by God. And so the sanctification is going to endure. Yes. In the same way that the Holy Spirit, he's like, don't worry about what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit's going to speak. Right, like, right. I mean, the way that it's worded is the Holy Spirit's going to speak. Like, don't, you're, yeah. you're not speaking here. Right. The Holy Spirit is speaking. And I think it's the same way. And I'm also going off of the fact that even in Jesus, you know, going through the will of God. So in experiencing the death on the cross, one of the things that I'm seeing even in Mark, even more so than Matthew, is it seems like the supernatural aspects of Christ being able to endure, making it to the cross, <laughs> enduring the cross and beyond, like, I mean, there had to be that supernatural aspect to it. It couldn't have been done. I don't. I don't really think in in his humanity, like right. you know, Holy Spirit on Jesus working. So well, and so apart from the context of Scripture, this could seem like conditional salvation. Yeah. But once you put it in its context, you know, then we know that He who's begun a good work in us is going to bring it to completion. Right. And so this is not designed to make us question necessarily, or or to make it seem like it's. We could possibly not endure, and the reality is it's going to be celebratory. We we are going to endure. Um, what about this deception of the elect, if possible, in verse 22? Yeah, that so, caught me in Matthew yeah. as well. <laughs> you know, it says, For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, the elect. And so the warning is be careful. Yeah, I see it just like Peter. You know, Satan has desired to sift you, but I've prayed for yeah. you. So you're not going to be sifted. Yeah, no, it's a, you, you will feel this, but it's you will be okay. <laughs> in Matthew, I remember trying to deal with this um, to to try to think. Okay, is because in my mind, there's two ways of of thinking. Either it is possible, and he's saying, you know, you get you guys got to be because they're going to try and they're going to perhaps succeed. But I think where I land is more that if it were possible, though it's not, um, is the other way of taking it. That Jesus is saying they would go to the extent, every extent possible, like there there's no stops for them to try to deceive, but thankfully, you know, in the sense of for the elect, we are kept secure. So within this chapter, we see again, like we saw in Matthew, a crescendoing of events, right. you know, stuff from the the normal things we see every day, the wars and rumors of wars, and then there's some persecutions kind of spiraling to a tighter circle here, but the abomination of desolation, which, you know, has happened and may happen again, suffering like never before. And then, you know, we get to verse 24. And then it's the signs within the heavens that would be unmistakable at this point. You know, yeah. we have things that could have happened or maybe not happening and could be happening right now. And, but then we get to verse 24. It's like, well, that ain't happening yet. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yep. Of all the other things, like these are the things that we base our calendar on. These are things that we base, you know, everything around. And so there is no possible way that you can look up things that are happening. I mean, perhaps technology will get better to where people will be able to explain something, some natural cause. Sure. But you would like to say that this has got to be supernatural. Yes. Anybody that's looking up being like, this is worrying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is concerning. This is, this is what Chicken Little was talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, especially the skies falling. Down. Yeah. The stars falling the from stars. the heavens. Yeah. yeah. The powers in heaven will be shaken. As far as I tell you, verse 30, I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Yeah. Okay. So that goes back to what Josephus was, was writing about. And so he referenced this verse talking about the disciples seeing all these things, except for the arrival of the Son of Man. That's the only thing. Yeah. Well, and uh, so I I did a little bit, uh, went down to wormhole on this one too, because oh, cool. in, in the context, it's going to make sense just a second. It's like, oh man, I get it. But at first glance, like, well, did that generation see all these things take place? Because I don't think, you know, the stars fell or the moon was darkened, the sun didn't give its light, you know, and a lot of these things that they did not see happen for sure. Uh, so for him to say that, you know, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place, uh, there, there's reason to say I don't I don't think that's that was fulfilled in the way it was told it's until we realize that the generation he's talking about is a generation that it begins to be fulfilled in. So whenever that generation mm -hmm. is, it's these things take place. Whenever you they, they begin to see these things, then particularly when you get to verse uh, 24, then obviously they're going to see the fulfillment of this. Well, why, why would we take that particular uh, interpretation of, of that passage? Uh, because verse 32, 
No one knows the day or the hour, not the angels in heaven, not even the sun. So how could he speak to which generation is going to see it? He couldn't. Jesus did not know when these things were going to take place. So he couldn't say, well, this generation is going to see it fulfilled because he's saying already, I don't know when it's going to happen. The angels don't know when. Only the Father knows when this is going to happen. So he's talking about a future generation um, that when it begins, they're going to see the fulfillment. It's going to happen in their, it's not like it's going to take these long periods of time, which we already know from Daniel. It's going to be a period of seven years in Revelation as well. I can I can definitely see the train of thought. Um, and yeah, quite too. honestly and transparently, I've, I'm not solid in my eschatology so to speak like <laughs> there's certain facts and so even in, even when i teach on eschatology like the end times and stuff with the students i'm always like hey guys there's a lot that we can debate about but here's what we do know and so i tend to focus on jesus coming back <laughs> there is going to be a new heaven new earth um and you know things along those lines as opposed to specifics uh i do know that one way that i've i've i haven't dove deep into what the arguments are for and against, but this generation being the generation as a bigger picture of uh, the church and like the church age. Mm -hmm. And so in the same mm -hmm. way that okay. surely I will be with you to even to the end of the age, we take that as the, the age of the church, the church age. So from the time of uh, essentially Pentecost, but even Jesus' ascension all the way until he returns. Yeah. So the interpretation of, hey, you guys I'm telling this to are going to see all these things doesn't work. But as far as those individuals that right, are right there right. present with it. But them. as far as interpretation of it's a future generation and or it's the generation of the church age, either one of those interpretations could work satisfactory to the to the passage. Yeah. Either way, you know, verse 33, watch out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the, the takeaways are the reality is that we are to be alert, yeah. to be vigilant. And so that uh, anytime we're teaching on end times, that's the same takeaway every time is that we don't know, we're not told when, and it could happen at any moment, at any point in time. And so the reality always comes back to, you know, watch out, stay alert, be be vigilant, you know, because this this thing could happen suddenly. And then the return is going to be suddenly. It says as much as in verse 36. Mm -hmm. This whole passage of the master going away and, and leaving the slaves in charge, and, and they, they better pay attention and they better stay alert because they don't know whether he's coming at night, in the evening, right. at midnight, at dawn, at the, when the rooster crows and all that type of stuff. So we got to be looking at all times. One of the things within the Jesus' anointing and this plan to betray Jesus as we continue through, um, I see Jesus putting it back into perspective again because... Uh, you know, he's just going over, he's taking so much effort to say, this is what is going to happen. And yet they're still worried about these temporary things. Um, you know, when it comes to, you know, this, this woman that comes and anoints Jesus' feet, they're still worried about the temporary things. He's yeah. just talked about how it's all going to pass away from the temple to, you know, all these things. And the stars are going to fall, like all that type of stuff. Yeah. And he's like, you guys are worried about the money. Like, yeah. this seems... Yeah. Again, guys, please get it. <laughs> yeah. Listen. One of the things that I, um, you know, was looking at, it was verse eight. She did what she could. Um, and mm -hmm. I just think that's an interesting sentence. It reminds me of, you know, just a few paragraphs before when, you know, Jesus is sitting across from the offering box and um, the widow puts in, you know, her, just her little, her little amount, but it was all that she had. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is kind of the same language for me. She did what she could. This is what she has. And she's going to, um, you know, fulfill the purpose that God has given her and you know that's what she feels led to do yeah and so I would I mean I would appreciate a change in the word to, to say she did everything she could yeah I feel like that's kind of the idea behind it even though it says you know what it's like the the point is that she held nothing back that's how our worship should be yeah word come on <laughs> that was the mic drop, right? <laughs> Holding nothing back. Yeah, I was reading in Psalm 149 this morning. They danced. You want some of that mm. action? <laughs> Worship we, dancers. I don't know. <laughs> then, you, then you start backsliding into what you know what David did, where he was right. he was not so dignified in <laughs> in his dancing. Yeah. yeah. Oh man, wait until we get to that one in the well, old. His wife didn't care for it, but I'm not sure God was upset. In well, the history and, of. Nothing, you know, if we have nothing to hide before God, I mean, oh, God's yeah. not going to be, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's the issue. But I was, I was just going to say, in the history of Oak Grove Baptist Church, the amount of people that we dismissed from membership for dancing in the early, um, like, or late 19th century was incredible. <laughs> you should read some of that in the old Ben's Meeting Minutes. Huh. Here? Yeah. I didn't know that. I we, didn't know that either. Yeah. Lillian and I were going what through What kind of time it, you like, got? I, 
It was, it was like a be a worship pastor in my next week. life. It was the end of school year last year. Lillian and I got the the business meeting minute book, and that we were started reading it. Wasn't it? I wanted to know. Yeah. So we yeah. we dismissed you people for dancing, stuff. not because they danced here, but because they, they, they danced, danced somewhere. somewhere else. Yeah, that's funny. I had a guy in high school, a guidance counselor, said a praying knee and a dancing foot don't grow on the same leg. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, tell that to David. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I mean, you read the Psalms and you see all this dancing. Like, how do you reconcile that? <laughs> cultural. That's that's a cultural irreconciliation. It's not okay. spiritual. <laughs> and so, I guess culturally, you know, we got to the point where dancing, mostly in our society, was something else. It was erotic, and you know, it was not it was not worshipful at all. And so, I think it became associated with uh, you know the night scene, the club scene, and all that. And so. Little by little, church says, oh, we can't have that because it's going on. And, and so Satan hijacked one more thing from us. Well, yeah. and quite honestly, it still is that way. <laughs> it is. Like, it is. I mean, it does not take very much, you know, as far as line. <laughs> yeah. It does not take very long before that line is crossed oh, into yeah. something that is. It starts, it starts off with a line dance and up with a bumping grind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And certainly culture is not helping us at all. Right there in front of God and everybody. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, we're going to dismiss you from the church. Yeah. <laughs> Let Satan have his way. Yeah. That um, was a long rabbit trail. It was. But I, okay. I, I do appreciate the fact that it is, you know, as we look into it, thinking through it, it's one more thing that Satan has hijacked from us. And he yeah. turned it into something that it's... It mm-hmm. is not good. Well, and it, it doesn't go that far from, uh, I mean, you think about the worship and, and these people, if they're coming from temple worship, which meant at times temple prostitutes, mm. and their worship was something that was totally against, you know, the will of God. Right. And, you know, the mixing of what is unsacred with what is sacred. And, you know, that that is, it's uh, it's across the board and it's, it's constant and... It, it is. Maybe that's part of the be alert <laughs> aspect of things. We're trying to tie it back. <laughs> when he moves into the Passover, it's one of the things you mentioned that, um, you know, Jesus doesn't know the day or the hour. He he says that himself. But yet there's so many things that he does know. Right. Even to the point where I'm amazed at just the fact that all the details that he's given. He's like, go into the city. You're going to find a guy carrying a jar. You know, there's going to be this. There's going to be that. So this is what you say to him. And he's going to respond. And. All that, and I'm Six like toes on one foot. Look for that. <laughs> there is some detail here. Yeah, I'm like, wait. So, it does make me wonder, and it has no bearing on anything really, but it does make me wonder. Did this guy was he just already set up? Like this is his side hustle. Like does he have an Airbnb? <laughs> He's got an Airbnb. I thought the same thing. Yeah, this guy didn't Passover. have his room all set up back. He's like. That. I know that there's a he, Passover coming. He's written that bad boy out. Yeah. Yeah. So then I wonder if, you know, if it was that or if it was actually just supernatural because it, it very well could be that, you know, God gave him a vision or something, you know, an inkling, so to speak, that he's well, like, hey, you know what? I got to give this ready because somebody might need it. Yeah. Well, and I think all of that factors in for sure. I mean, he might have had a desire that was completely, you know, as, as far as financial. And, and God says, yeah, that's perfect because we're going to yeah. use it for we'll, something yeah, else. Yeah, we'll use <laughs> you it. go ahead and build that. We'll redeem it. Yes. Uh, but I also thought, too, They're this guy dance carrying, up in here. carrying the water has got 12 dudes following. <laughs> 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 See where he goes. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> At some point, you feel like you notice 12 guys behind you, right? Yeah. yeah. I was like, this ain't weird. You're not creepy. <laughs> yeah. And the teacher says, Where, where's my guest room? Or where may you pass over for my disciples? And he'll show you a large room. And it's finished and ready and prepared there. And it's just as he said. I love it. Every detail. From my perspective, the greater application is from the homeowner within this particular portion of the story. It's uh, He had the space and perhaps for, for guests, VRBO or whoever it was, but... He was willing to share, eager to share, perhaps. And so God had given this man the, the means and opportunity for this very occasion. And so what has God given us is kind of was a takeaway that, that we're not necessarily using or utilizing for kingdom work. Mm. It goes back to the anointing and the sacrifice, too, right? Yeah. Don't hold anything back. We'll, we'll leave the Lord's Supper. Um, Pastor Randall preached on that this past week, and so go back and, and look at that. We'll, we'll kind of let that be the word on the Lord's Supper unless you guys want to add anything else that we didn't mention. I've got either. other stuff, oh, man. This is hard to cover it all in a sermon, right? You let me say all that, and then you say I got more. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. I was going to let you go ahead. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, the betrayal was part of every writer's story, and it's interesting that, uh, that it was such a— major theme within the story that, that Jesus was betrayed. And I think there's something for that uh, for us, that if, it was, if betrayal was part of our Lord's story, then who are we, right? As people turn against you in life or do things to 
Yeah, betray and look, betrayal is not something that an enemy does. It's something that a friend does, somebody that's close to you. That well, is, and I would also say that that's probably one of the things that's the hardest to forgive. It is, yes. I think it uh, leaves lasting marks, and um, you know, people carry that baggage a long time, sometimes a lot longer than they have to. And so that was uh, one of the thoughts I had as far as that being part of his story. So if it's part of ours, then. You know, it's just that's us more like him, right? And then the second part of that, obviously, it's Judas that betrays him. Jesus knows this. This is mm-hmm. not new news. He knows right. exactly yeah. who's going to betray him. <laughs> Yet, you know, he introduces the idea, somebody's going to betray me. They all say, you know, is it I? Who is it? Tell us who it is. And even you go to John, and I like his his version of it. Uh, Peter motions to John. like, hey, you ask him. And yeah. you know, it kind of gives him the head nod. <laughs> yeah. John records it that way. He's like, you know, Peter urges the one that Jesus loves to, yeah. you know, because I'm right there, you know, leaning against him. And so in that, uh, and Jesus doesn't, he doesn't tell. No. Instead, he gives us this uh, very unique map. <laughs> mm-hmm. The reality is there's some idea where there's going to be a dipping of bread and hanging it to Judas and, and him or him dipping with me. And, uh, and the disciples didn't catch any of that. And so my thoughts were, and I know you guys are watching today, is he going to get anywhere with this? <laughs> <laughs> what? Why? Why not just say, hey, it's Judas. I mean, they're going to find out. Yeah. It's not like it's going to be hidden forever. And this is conjecture. So I'm going to put this out there for, you know, the whole world to tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> it's um, Jesus didn't reveal his identity because he still loved him. And, uh, and love covers a multitude of sins. Well, and, and there's going to be offenses in this life. People are going to hurt and... Um, you know, betray. And the Proverbs 17, 9 says the person that conceals these offenses promotes love. Mm. And so Jesus in this moment is, is living that out. Oh yeah. Instead of revenge, because it's our nature to say, Oh yeah, we're not only we're going to reveal it, we're going to reveal it to everybody Mm. (laughs) as often as we can. We're going to let everybody know where the line in the sand is and you get to choose my side because they're terrible. And that is the the nature of the flesh and the nature of the spirit is to conceal. Because that promotes love instead of outing someone and, mm-hmm. and, you know, putting their nose in it, making sure everybody knows what kind of terrible person they are. Yeah, there's definitely a lesson there. Well, there you go. <laughs> That's what you didn't get in the sermon. That's right. Yeah, was, uh, the sermon went a different direction, but there, there was thoughts. I want to point out, you know, verse 26, because it's the worship leader in me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you did in Matthew too, dude. Yeah, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. The hymns. <laughs> Were, were the Hallel Psalms, mm-hmm. um, and they would have sang uh, Psalm 115, 116, 117, and 118. Yep. And some of the words, you know, if if these are the things that, that Jesus is singing on his way out to the Mount of Olives is kind of interesting, and I wanted to read a few, few of these verses. In my distress, I cried to the Lord. The Lord answered me and put me in a wide open space. The Lord is on my side, and I am not afraid. And these are the, these are the words that Jesus is singing as he's about to go and be betrayed. Um, they surrounded me like bees, but they disappeared as quickly as fire among thorns. Indeed, in the name of the Lord, I pushed them away. You aggressively attacked me and tried to knock me down, but the Lord helped me. He ends with, I will give thanks for you have answered me and you have become my deliverer. Um, I give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his loyal or steadfast love endures forever. That's hard to sing right when you know that one of your best friends is going to betray you. Yeah. Um, and also, one of the one of the things we quote out here often is, "This is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it." How how do you go about rejoicing in in something like that when you know that your your death is imminent? What I what I come come to when I read this is, I understand why Jesus became so distressed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Essentially, um, you know, he knows these psalms, and so he knows what he's singing, and then he 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 knows what's coming. And so I think part of his his reason for going and praying is because he felt he felt this a little bit for sure, and it's uh, and his his experience is unique, so it's uh, we can't really relate. No, but I think we also do feel obviously yeah, not relating in the same extent, right? And not for the same purpose of you know, Jesus was unique in in what his death brought, but in terms of you know the fact that we can hold fast and declare the victory and know that death is not the end and know that 
um, even in death, even if there is a strong, good purpose in it or whatever, in terms of like when we change our perspective and say, okay, well, when we see that death is not the end and it's actually just the beginning, it's what, you know, from this life to the next and the next life being eternal and more significance, then that definitely changes our perspective. But at the same time, we're still in that turmoil in terms of grief, in terms of the sadness, in terms of loss, in terms of what we know here. And, uh, and this, and because it is all we know, uh, mm -hmm. we don't have the sight to be able to see into heaven and into, you know, what's coming and stuff. We trust, but we don't have the sight to be able to see. And so even within that, I know, I know for myself, it, it's that back and forth and that constant carrying of, of both, you know, you have this, what you rely on, but you also have what you're feeling, so to speak. And that's what I think the Psalms are so great at. Mm -hmm. You know, that there's so many times where it's this tension, this turmoil, this turmoil, this mm -hmm. turmoil. But I'm holding on to this is what the truth is. Um, and I think it's also the enduring, too. You know, that whole enduring to the end, I think that's part of it. Yeah. I think it's necessary to, to have that endurance. Josh mentioned uh, Psalm 118 and others. I, I wanted to, one of the things that I looked at was Psalm 22 because Jesus quotes it a lot. And so as we're getting into the Gethsemane and his betrayal and his crucifixion and, and all of that, Psalm 22 is so heavily quoted in various dif different ways by various different people. I wanted to make sure that everybody, you know, listening and stuff kind of sees that too. So it opens up, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so we know that this is the quote that, that Jesus is kind of using on the cross. And so, you know, we're seeing a lot of these things, but then down in verse seven, it says, everyone who sees me mocks me, they sneer and they shake their heads. We're seeing that as Jesus is going to the cross, that people are wagging their heads and they're disgracing him. Uh, in verse 12, it says, Many bulls surround me, strong ones of Bashan encircle me. They open their mouths against me, lions mauling and roaring. The people that are coming against him, he called them the brood of vipers and various things. Like they, it's so similar in those things. It says, My bones are disjointed. My heart is like wax. It's melting within me. We talk about how Jesus' crucifixion and how his heart broke quite literally, at least all the medical people that have kind of researched the crucifixion and what happened with Jesus and the fact that the, there was, you know, when they poked him in his side and what came out, it says, my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth in verse 15. That's happening in Jesus' crucifixion. For the dogs have surrounded me, a gang of evildoers have closed in on me. The dogs would be like the Gentiles. They would have that slang and term. Um, they pierced my hands and my feet. Of course, that's very clear. They divided my garments amongst themselves and they cast lots for my clothing. And that's one of the, one of the other things of why I kind of went back to this because I was like, when they divided his clothes, what is the purpose other than humiliation perhaps and to fulfill prophecy? Like, so there's just different elements in, in what people are doing and what's happening here. And I'm like, man, prophecy, you know, scripture time and time again. Um, but I also want to mention that this is not where it ended. In verse 24, of Psalm 22, it says, For he has not despised or detested the torment of the afflicted. He is he did not hide his face from him, but listened when he cried to him for help. I will give praise in the great congregation because of you. I will fulfill my vows before you who fear. I will humble and eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will bow down before you, for kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. Skipping down to 31. They will come and tell people yet to be born about his righteousness, what he has done. And that's amazing to me in terms of we're seeing what God has done. And it's all because of what Christ has done. It's all because what we are seeing here in this mm -hmm. um, chapters 14 and 15. And it's amazing to me because when we look at this, the reason why God doesn't forsake us is because God did forsake Jesus. It, when, when Jesus is saying, why have you forsaken me? It's the forsakenness of Jesus as to why God responds to us in a way that he has not despised us. He has not dejected us. He's not, you know, detested us. He's, he's not hidden our, his face from us, but he's actually accepted us and we can praise him because of what he has done. What do you think it actually means when he declares, why have you forsaken me? Yeah. I mean, obviously it's a quote, so perhaps <coughs> it's just that. It's the yeah, I mean, metaphorical, it symbolic, or it could mean a lot more than that. What do you think actually happened? Well, so in my reading, it's uh, a lot of times you, you read stuff like, okay, I see where that could have been what was being proclaimed there. The, the translation could easily be, show why you have forsaken me, mm -hmm. not that he's 
questioning why that he doesn't understand. So let's yeah. get past that. The idea is like, let's reveal why you have forsaken me. And, mm -hmm. um, and it was in that moment or shortly right thereafter that the, the veil was torn in half. Mm -hmm. And so gaining access to, to God and to the interest of throne of grace. And so that was the, you know, perhaps the gist of what he was revealing in that statement, you know, we're, we're about to reveal why this is happening and so that you can have access so that you can be drawn brought near those who are far off. I, I was reading about this too. And, um, one of the things that I came across of the guy that was writing the commentary, he said, you know, this could very well just be a quote, or he was saying, this is what Jesus really felt. He yeah. felt the abandonment, um, from his father. And so in his humanity and in his flesh, this is what he wanted to cry out because he felt abandoned. Yeah. You know, I don't know what he really felt because I wasn't there, but I'm sure that he did feel abandonment. I mean, I can see it that way for sure. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that I was reading too is that they were saying that this, at the very least, it was, this is what was stored up in his heart mm -hmm. and this is why it came out. Right. You know, in the same way that we would hit, a, <laughs> hit our thumb with a hammer or whatever, what comes out of your mouth then? <laughs> you know, like Jesus is, is bearing the weight of sin on himself. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I, I agree that with Randall, I don't, there, there doesn't seem to be any indication that the Jesus is, is literally actually questioning why. Right. It's not right. that he's he's really wondering why. It's more a matter of he's pointing to the fact of what is happening here, and the perhaps if we're trying to figure out like what exactly it means that God forsake him. Um, well, Psalm twenty two says that he did not hide his face. So yeah, obviously he didn't look away. Well, and God was in it. Right. You know, and the like so one of the thoughts is okay. So well, if you have the triune God, the triune God cannot like I don't think yeah, that he it can't literally break. Yeah. yeah, I don't think it broke the Trinity. You know, there's something about that that yes, God is still present in the wrath being poured out on His Son. The Holy Spirit perhaps is even still ministering to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so, when you're looking at this, and and they knew what the plan was. It wasn't again. It wasn't spontaneous. It wasn't like reactive or whatever. They knew. And so, it may have been in fact that Jesus was feeling that God was the Father, in whom He had such close communion, even mm -hmm. in His humanness. He refused to to answer Him. Like in that sense, like he refused to, to acknowledge in, in the wrath. Those are the things I'm trying to think through. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's a uh, part of, you know, every time I read this story, particularly in, the, in each of the gospels, it, it just strikes me that uh, he's being tried. He says nothing. He says nothing. And finally, mm -hmm. it's like, are you the Messiah? And he's like, I am. I am. Mm -hmm. Now, the idea that that be true is just not in the wheelhouse <laughs> for those who are questioning. So there's only two options. It's it's a lie and he's guilty of blasphemy. Or the fact that there is coming a Messiah, is it not possible anywhere in their wheelhouse that, that he could be the Messiah? It's just a, such a rejection of the possibility is, is staggering to me. Uh, each time I read it, it's like, well, you know, let's investigate this, guys. You know, that's just not what they're there for. I get it. I know the end, but it's like watching a movie and you don't like the ending, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> all that the ending is good for us. It's, so once the high priest tears his clothes and says, well, that's it, verdict's in. Yeah, we don't need condemned. any witnesses. Yeah, We've that's heard it. it. And then, then mob, mob mentality takes over. All these people who they were afraid of just hours before jump on the bandwagon, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you crucify him. Well, obviously they were you know, told to say that or encouraged to say that, but... Uh, humanity quickly degrades to the worst version of itself, given the freedom to do so. So the moment that the high priest declares, you know, he's blasphemed, then people who may have just a day earlier been shouting Hosanna are now quick to, you know, jump in there. It's like, I'm going to take a swing at him. You know, let's just yeah. hit him. You know, just walk by and smack him in the back. You know, just all the the vile stuff that goes on moving forward just because... Humanity, given the freedom to do so, quickly degrades to the worst version of itself. Yeah. Well, and, and sometimes it's not even violent. Like, you know, my mind goes to we we have a mom mentality in terms of even just the status quo. Yeah. Even in terms of what we get distracted by, even in terms of, I mean, you name it, like the things that catch our attention. I mean, if you just keep track of the news and how quickly we latch on to something and then all of a sudden something else pops up and we're like, oh, okay. We totally forgot about the rest of it. Mm -hmm. And I know that some of like we, we talk about how I wonder if that's how often is that intentional? Yeah. You know, 
um, or I think about, you know, all these people. I'm like, how many of these people are spending so much money just to watch one woman sing? <laughs> I'm like, she's the first billionaire, you know, made by music. Yeah. I'm like, what does that say about us? I mean, because you can't all think that, okay, this is really the greatest singer that's ever lived I think or something Michael like that. Michael Swifty. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mention no names. <laughs> um, but, I mean, it does. It, I mean, it could be the, the Beatles back in, you know, whatever time, 60s, 60s. I guess, when they were the most famous. But, I mean, uh, Elvis, you know, mm. all those. Like, at any given point in time, you know that most people are like, if they really stopped and thought about it, is this really the greatest person that's ever been around? Mm -hmm. You right. know, in terms of you know, greatest player, greatest singer, greatest musician, et cetera. How quickly we um, we switch. Yeah. So, so stay, if you, if you could choose one thing that you could get away with, what would you do? That, that's the question. <laughs> and not one that's not a great question because I think it it just shows our natural proclivity. Because when we're asked that question, automatically we begin to think, here's what I would do mm -hmm. if I knew I'd never get caught. And the fact that we have that in us is just exactly what we're seeing here. It's, it's mm -hmm. in them. And yeah. so the moment the high priest says, all right, do your worst. And it's like, okay, <laughs> let's get after it. There had to be an element like that because when we're an outsider <clears throat> looking in and they release Barabbas instead. Yeah. I mean, this guy is an insurrectionist is kind of how it's termed. Um, you know, he committed a murder during an insurrection, like these types of things. So perhaps they could, at least some people considered him a terrorist. And so they're like, yeah, we'll, we'll take him over Jesus. Yeah. Does anyone know why it was custom to release a prisoner on Passover? I didn't research that, but I mm -mm. didn't know if you guys did um, off the top of your head. Boy, I could jump into some things right there that I've read that might not even be right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the so, thing about reading stuff. <laughs> that is, yeah, you're reading enough, like, wait a minute, is that what, is what I read that? <laughs> um, so they had several customs in the Jewish tradition of releasing things as part of worship. And so there was uh, a custom where there was worship and release of a bird. One would die okay. and one, one mm -hmm. would be released. Mm -hmm. And so even the scapegoat, one would die and one would get released. And so I think it kind of maybe comes back to that custom where he honors the Jewish customs yeah, in this okay. releasing yeah. of something that was deserving of death. Well, and the genius of the Romans was that they they didn't necessarily rule with you know such tyranny as much as they they allowed people to kind of live, but they still have their limits, <laughs> right? <laughs> which yeah. I, which is part yeah. of this. And so they're like, okay, if we can appease these people by throwing them a bone every once in a while, then we'll do that. Right. Yeah. So live your life, recognize that we own you, that you still owe us money, but live your yeah. life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Other things that you guys are seeing within chapter 15. Um, the only other time, you know, the word for torn is used in Mark is when the heavens were tore open. In Jesus' baptism, and so mm -hmm. the heavens were torn open in Jesus, and, and the Father says, this is my son, you know, who yeah. I am well pleased. In this chapter, it's the veil was torn, and a Gentile man says, truly, this mm -hmm. was God's son. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of see the bookend there. That's rich. Yeah. Yeah. Flesh and blood has not revealed that to you. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that kind of speculates, um, you know, going off of Josh's is more spiritual. <laughs> Um, Thanks a lot, Josh. Yeah. I do have a, I have of. one unspiritual thing that I want to talk about, but we, <laughs> okay, we, we can do so, yours first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the man who you know the passerby Simon of Cyrene, um, it mentions that he was the father of Alexander and Rufus, and I'm like, okay, well let's let's go ahead and look this up and see if there, we know of anything. And I don't think that anybody's really come up with anything other than the fact that there is a chance that Rufus may have been the one mentioned in Romans sixteen thirteen. And so he may have actually been like uh, a big, a great leader within the early church. And so, you know, it's one of those things where if, you know, if, then, man, this family and the man that carried Jesus' cross and how much that influenced his people, yeah. uh, you know, as far as his two sons that were with him, um, right. he does make a point to, to mention that, you know, he was the father well, of these two. And also with that, so if Mark was writing to Romans, and, you know, Rufus happened to be some, you know, big guy, mm -hmm. then this was like some credibility for yeah, them. Name dropping. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. Well, and, and furthermore, you know, the whole song Watch the Lamb now has... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he did have little kids there, or maybe yeah. they weren't little. Who knows? Yeah. <clears throat> oh, yeah. yeah. That's throwing it back. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it just clicked. Like, <laughs> yeah. Them youngins. Daddy, Stop. daddy, what are we to do today? He's like, watch the lamb. Yeah. It was a good song. It was. Mm -hmm. Uh, what else did you see, Josh? 
What was your um, less than spiritual In the spiritual end of perhaps. chapter 14, a young man was following him wearing only a linen cloth. Yes. And they tried to arrest him, but he ran off naked. Yeah, yeah. Uh, deep conspiracy thoughts here. Oh, man. <laughs> what, if, what if this was actually Mark? So here's why. Okay. Yeah, now we're really getting into it. Mark's mother owned, you know, based on Acts, owned a house in Jerusalem. And the conspiracy also goes as far as, you know, maybe that is the same house that they would have had Passover at. Yeah. And, you know, Mark being a it was young bath man. Day for Mark. Yeah, right. <laughs> Mark bath being day. a young man <laughs> at his house for Passover that he would have wanted to follow the disciples out into the garden. And so he possibly would have been there. And but so that's just deep. At conspiracy. some point, not having time to actually put <laughs> right, clothes. Right, no on. clothes. Yeah. <laughs> but he's the only one that records this episode. So. Yeah. Why would he feel the need to put it in there? He if wasn't going to name himself. Yeah. <laughs> well, of I course mean, not. He's embarrassed. He's naked. <laughs> look, sounds to me like they've got a, a resisting arrest charge here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you left your clothes in order to get away, then then you're fighting. And back. now Mark is preaching in Rome. So, <laughs> yeah. along with Rufus, uh, right? Along now. with Rufus, Rufio. <laughs> you yeah. probably got pants on now. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's my deep conspiracy thoughts. Ah, there you go. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> One of the things that I do want to mention, though, within all of this, is um, for for whatever reason, like, I don't think it really matters why necessarily if the women were just not considered as, you know, so they didn't care about the women, whether they, um, you know, just let them go, so to speak. So they didn't seek to arrest them. And so maybe the women felt like they were more confident or whatever. But even regardless of all of that, just giving credit to the fact that, man, these women are the ones that follow Jesus. They're the ones that are consistently like in the rest of Mark, mm -hmm. they are the ones that are there all the time, especially the Marys and just the fact that they're they're looking to anoint him. They are like gung ho. They were like waiting for the Sabbath to be over so that they can go back right. and, and take care of him. And and it's one of those things where I'm like even trying to to see like, okay, well what is their emotional state within all of this? And of course the distress and the distraughtness and, and so it's from the anointing, you know, of Mary and she's like, hey, she's getting it to they wanted to anoint him further, to they were there at the cross and they didn't run off. Um, to the fact that they were the first ones to see, I mean, so many different elements within this. I think it's amazing to the fact that they, they are like, man, we, we kind of give or get the impression that maybe they didn't quite understand as well along with the rest as far as that they expected Jesus to rise from the dead. Um, we don't really get the impression that anybody really 100% like, okay, yeah, except, we're just, we're just waiting. the Pharisees. Well, <laughs> they I mean, knew what he said. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> So I'm not, they, I mean, they thought that people were going to steal his body. Right, yeah, they did not believe, obviously. Yeah. But so here's, here's where I'm going with this. In the garden, you know, it says that, and we find out later that Eve was deceived. And so she was the one that kind of spurred things on. Now, given the responsibility of humanity and sin lies on Adam, women, so to speak, if I can generalize, are redeemed in this because they are not deceived. Like they are understanding perhaps even more than some of these men are. It's so interesting, too, that even after they were given the information that uh, they didn't say anything because they were be bewildered and afraid. Afraid, yeah. It's and all so, the emotions. Yeah. <clears throat> but there is something substantial to their love for Jesus being so supreme that uh, I agree that the very moment that they were allowed legally to be there, mm -hmm. that uh, that's what they did. And so I think it uh, that particular care and affection for them, put them in a situation where they were able to be the first ones to, to see the resurrected. Yeah. How should we deal with the, the last part, the longer ending of Mark? I know Josh wants to get into it. <laughs> well, so here's how I see the ending of Mark. And I think it's, I think the, the short ending is, is sufficient. And here's why. One, you, you already know that Jesus is risen. Angels are, are known to be trustworthy. So, you know, when, when an angel tells something in Scripture, they're not lying. <laughs> they're direct messengers from God. Um, so when the angel says, you know, do not be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who is crucified. He has been raised. Um, he's not here. And then he points to the place where they were laying. And so I think it's interesting that if, you know, if Mark really didn't write this ending part, which I'm pretty convinced he didn't, um, then... You know, he, he leaves you with a question in your mind. Are you going to respond in faith or are you going to respond in fear? Um, because it says that the women <laughs> ran away in bewilderment and uh, they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. 
you know, it's very pastoral, I think, to leave, you know, an open-ended, you know, kind of thing like this, where you have to come to the conclusion yourself, are you going to believe, you know, this is what's written, are you going to believe it, or are you not? And so that's why I like the short ending of Mark. The long mm-hmm. ending, it just seems like it tried too hard. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't think it takes away from anything. Uh, obviously, we have more account of what happened afterwards in the other Gospels as well. So, I mean, yeah. I'm not saying it's not inspired or anything. I just <laughs> think that... <clears throat> If Mark wanted to end it there, I think he did something unique. From the English translation, if nobody told us that we should question that ending, we would never question it. it right. It is only because people have questioned it that it came into question. And they question it because there's some manuscripts that don't have it. So they're trying yeah, to the earliest to ones. the earliest. And so in... Well, we go down a rabbit hole of textual criticism here, which I'm going to go ahead and put it out there. I'm not the biggest fan of, and I've been through it, and I did all three years of seminary, and you know, we, we dealt with it over and over again. Mm-hmm. Textual criticism relies on presuppositions that may or may not be true. I mean, so they say, hey, the, the shorter reading is preferred to the longer reading. They say that because they feel like over time people will add rather than take away. You know, over, <clears throat> there, there is some validity to that claim, but it's not an absolute. It's a, sure. It's a... Perhaps something that is is believed, generally agreed upon, that is the normal, but it doesn't mean that's true in every situation. And there's so many other components of textual criticism that is used, and it's a science that's unfortunate, but it's it's necessary. I get it. We've got over five thousand and eight hundred manuscripts, Greek manuscripts. None of them are the complete version of the New Testament. Right. All of them are portions, mm-hmm. and so we have to look at all of these. 5,800 manuscripts, and, uh, and, and so over time, that's where, you know, what happened. We, we compiled them into a completed form. And from those, we have all the complete works, obviously. It's not like, you know, we have just a little bit here and there. It's a lot. Most of them are a lot of the completed manuscripts and, uh, or nearly completed manuscripts. And so it's not like, you know, this great big scientific puzzle where we got to figure it out. It's, it's, yeah. it's mostly there. But there are some areas occasionally like the end of Mark where a manuscript would leave off, you know, quite, quite a bit of this or a manuscript would add quite a bit of this. I've been, you know, it's half full or half empty. Right. Right. Well, yeah. And I would also say that that's where the discrepancies, so to speak, between translations come. Right. And so anytime you see a video that's like, Oh, well, you know, the King James has this and all the other Bibles, they took it out. Right. It's not because they're, it's not the motivation of, well, we're going to try to deceive people. It's the motivation of, Hey, we're going to try to be true to these texts that we are putting weight on. You know, sometimes most will go towards earlier and they'll give mm-hmm. weight to earlier as opposed to later because they just, again, the assumption is they're more closely, more r- reliable in the sense of, you know, you got first person witness that's different than second, third, fourth. Yeah, but we don't have a first person. Correct. Yeah. Right. So every, yeah. every witness we have is removed from the originals. We do not have yeah. the original autographs anymore. So everything is a, a manuscript that existed earlier Sinaiticus and Vaticanus were found yeah. in, in you know, Sinai and the Vatican. And so those are two early texts, earlier texts that we didn't have for a long time. They're from one of them found in a trash can, actually. And, uh, and so these are two very early texts now that we're able to look at. I agree with the general presupposition that closer to the event is the more legitimatized uh, typical text. However... Yeah. However, here's here's another caveat. I'm gonna throw I'm gonna throw a bomb in this. Are you ready? No. The, this is gonna mess you right up. I am. For centuries, the church did not have these two texts. So, did they have the Word of God or did they not? I'm gonna say they had the Word of God. They had the Word of God. And was it complete or incomplete? You know, I still got to say it was complete because they still had thousands of manuscripts. Now, so Erasmus, we go going back a little bit. Erasmus compiled com- put the text together into the Textus Receptus, the TR, and the mm-hmm. TR is a very Mm -hmm. well-known Greek formalized version of the New Testament. So he took all these, again, manuscripts. Now, Erasmus lived like uh, 1500s. I don't remember the exact dates of his life. So he didn't have access to all the things we have access to, particularly computers uh, or all the manuscripts. He had a lot, but he didn't have all of them. And so we know for sure that Erasmus back translated some of the passages from Latin into Greek in order to form the Texas Receptus. The King James is translated primarily from the TR. Yeah. Right. TR is not the most legitimate Greek version of the New Testament. It's good and it's reliable and it's authoritative, but it's I mean to say that it couldn't be improved upon would not be a a good statement. And so, you know, we for a long time, and, and again, this goes back to, to my own baggage, 
the, the King James Version being the best Bible out there, that that's a tough claim to maintain. <laughs> Once you look at all the evidence, like I'm not sure I can get along with that that claim. I think it's a great Bible. If you're reading the King James Version, keep reading it. It's going to do you well. It's fine. I love the poetry of it. I grew up with it. In fact, if you hear me quoting in messages, almost 90% of what I'll say off the cuff is King James Version because that's what I have memorized and grew up on, and I love it. To say that you know we couldn't have a better translation, one, it's not true, but I think languages change. Translations should change with it. Or to say that we can't take another look at the Greek is also not uh, a very good logical idea either. That at some point, you know, as we discover more text, and uh, and we have, you know, the archaeologists are still digging up stuff. You know, mm-hmm. at one point in time, we didn't have Dead Sea Scrolls, and now we do. And so I think keep coming back to the table and saying, okay, let's reassess, make sure we got the very best version that we can have, is a good way to approach Scripture and uh, should not. Uh, demean our belief or faith in the Word of God, e- even in our translation of it. Now, back to the point, should this passage exist or not exist? Some translators say absolutely it should be there. Others say absolutely not. And, and there are strong opinions on both sides of this. And, uh, hmm. you know, it comes down to I'm glad they put it. And here's why. Because it uh, at least gives me the option. (laughs) And this is where I'm at. I'd rather have the option than not have the option. And I've looked at this thing a long time, and I can't tell you whether it should be or shouldn't be. But at the same time, I'd rather. uh, So, and again, we talked about this earlier before we ever got in here. The reality of these passages don't change anything doctrinally. So this, this edition does not introduce any new doctrine and doesn't degrade any existing doctrine. And so it's a... It's lateral, and so if it's not supposed to be there, it's not cost you anything. And if it is supposed to be there, and it is there, it's not cost you anything. (laughs) And so when Randall handles snakes next week, then you know where he's getting it from. (laughs) Yes, yes, and I'm going to drink poison too. Yeah. Yeah, because that's all in there, right? (laughs) Right, yeah. (laughs) Completely out of context. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I think part of it, trying to bring it back to, like, some of what we've been seeing is is the staying alert and, and the fact that we can, especially nowadays, we've got way more ability to um look at evidences yeah. look at mm-hmm. texts right. and look at you know yeah. what all the things that we can look at basically yes. and it's a lot easier it doesn't it take is. nearly as much time right. and so we should be doing the work I agree. Um, you know as far as similar to like the encouragement of the Brians, you know that we go home and we take a look and and this is part of what we're trying to encourage everybody you know through yeah. this like let's 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 figure this out let's talk through it let's try to figure out along with other believers you know, what God's word is, is telling us and, and what we pull from it. And not just that, but we, we remind ourselves in terms of staying alert that we remind ourselves the main thing is the main thing, as opposed to let's let's figure out the secondary, tertiary, and so on, like what things matter that's and what right, things yeah. don't. Yeah, somebody said if we can discuss it in heaven, it was secondary. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm going to take us back to verse 15. Mm-hmm. And uh, whoever wrote this, I like it. <laughs> he said to them Amen. go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and this has been an ongoing theme at the conclusion of these uh, podcasts it's like hey yeah. our job is to go and share and particularly in the book of Mark the reason I like this verse 15 so much is because throughout the entire book Mark has gone out of his way to record don't tell nobody keep it quiet don't even go back into the city don't just go straight to your house and get under your bed mm-hmm. <laughs> basically it was the the, the thing that and, and Jesus you know refused to let the demons speak and the people he healed he didn't want them telling anything and even the disciples at Mount Transfiguration you can't tell anybody and so it's this idea of not yet not yet mm-hmm. not yet ready set not yet now go yeah mm-hmm. and it's uh, and so it's like it builds a crescendo and so at, uh, this verse fifteen I love it particularly at the end of Mark because there is such a pregnancy to this idea of not telling and and now Jesus says now. Go tell everybody. Hallelujah. I was like, yeah, I, was, I could dance to that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to end the podcast by Randall dancing. Ready? Yeah. <laughs> there it is. Uh, Look here dance for you. Yeah. Um, we'll pick up next week and, and Luke. Um, we're excited to see another perspective and uh, keep at it. We've got journals if you guys don't have them already. And uh, we'll try to make sure in Luke that we are actually going to be bringing some more people in. Uh, so maybe we'll have some guests as, as time goes on. So I knew they would get me out of here. This is what I, was <laughs> I didn't know how, but that's now it's introduced. So. All right. We'll see you guys next time. <laughs> have a good one.